Hi, I'm Ben Schwartz. I'm here talking today with uh, Jay Healy. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, um, agriculture and rural development in the region. I'm here with Jay Healy and also with Kelly Irwin and John Wade. Jay is the, the uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut Rhode Island Director of the USDA's Rural Development Program. And Kelly is the Director of Massachusetts Farm to School Project. John is the executive director of the Franklin County Community Development Corporation. And we just wanted to discuss a little bit about what each of these entities do, how they interact, how they um, help to um, develop the economy of the region and improve agriculture. Um, and Jay, you know, I, I, I know that when people talk about USDA and when you hear about USDA, people think, okay, you know, Wheat and cows and and and, and expanses. Inspect, inspecting pork bellies. That's exactly right. Yes, <laughs> inspections of pork bellies, and, uh, and and it's more than that. It's more than that, and it's it, there's a significant economic development component. There's a significant um, role in developing infrastructure, housing, um, the workforce, and uh, and you know if you could talk a little bit more about what USDA does within your program, and we can talk a little bit later about how it. Um, relates to what Kelly and John are doing? Great, Ben. Thanks a lot. Um, rural development is a, a hybrid part of USDA. We have over 45 programs to help with rural economic development, and most of the definitions for rural are, are related to population limits. Uh, so we can work in uh, sometimes uh, communities less than 50,000, sometimes less than 20,000, sometimes less than 10,000. But overall, uh, three of our main programs are business programs where we often do loan guarantees and we come in uh, places like Boltwood Place. We did a loan guarantee behind a bank on that to help with that. Uh, we also have a community facilities program where we did over $50 million worth of business this last year uh, with some of the programs in John's shop and others. Um, I know things like uh, water and sewer is part of that, uh, helping with uh, 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 early childhood learning down Granby, a program there, Children's First, uh, um, get involved with a little bit of solar. We did a, quite a bit uh, as a loan guarantee behind a big solar project in uh, Greenfield where they built a big, uh, I think what, $13 million program with yeah. a lot of solar collectors there over, a, over an old landfill. Mm -hmm. um, housing, we do a lot of housing, affordable housing for people. Uh, in just last year, uh, almost $400 million worth of uh, help with uh, housing, often first time home buyers, uh, very low uh, foreclosure rates. Uh, over uh, 1,200 families just in that program for one year. So we do a lot more than people are aware of. Right. Um, and um, people have heard uh, disaster assistance. That's often the Farm Service Agency, which is a sister agency to rural development. And there's a lot of farm help for environmental improvements called EQUIP, the Natural Resource and Conservation Service, NRCS. But we're one of the three main legs of the USDA stool, but there's off, uh, also a, a lot of uh, uh, projects that come out of the national office for USDA that we'll probably discuss a little later on. So it is a confusing array of uh, programs, but a, a lot of what we do is rural economic development and loan guarantees. So we're often behind a bank and people aren't aware of the breadth of our activity mm -hmm. often because we have very little grant money, but when you sometimes come in behind a bank, they might not say, well, that wind turbine up in Berkshire East, for example, we've never done a wind turbine, but we'll come in and maybe do a 70 or 80% loan guarantee behind the bank, so they'll have less money at risk. The project actually happens, a lot of construction, a lot of jobs, uh, help with the businesses involved. So. Uh, we do a lot of good stuff. So it makes it um, more appealing for a bank and less risky, and it might make it cheaper for the, um, the loan recipient. Ultimately, they might get a better loan, a uh, better rate um, yeah, that, if you're guaranteeing That's it. right. Money is inexpensive right now, but for instance, for a water and sewer program, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but people need to 
It was the Department of Environmental Protection saying, hey, you got to upgrade your sewer system. We, we have a little over 3% money, but it stretches out over 40 years. Mm -hmm. Most banks maybe go 20 years, maybe up to 30 sometimes. Yeah, most, yeah. uh, so stretching it out, it allows rate payers or people that are, uh, um, you know, need to improve a water and sewer system in a part of their town, uh, makes it doable uh, with uh, pretty advantageous terms for a municipality that might need to put an addition into their fire station or improve their their water uh, their water system. Now you uh, were a significant conduit for some of the federal stimulus money. Is that right? That's right. The stimulus money was uh, incredible. We spent almost eight hundred million dollars in the stimulus year. In our average years, maybe two hundred, two hundred and fifty, right, three hundred million. And uh, you know what I like about it is everybody gives a knock on government, saying, "Geez, we're out there with six hundred dollar toilets and all this." And uh, you know, the people we deal with are very appreciative. Of, I mean, because you need infrastructure and. And these things don't get funded by the private sector often. And it's really nice to know that uh, though those of us who are still in public service, uh, we might cling to a naive notion that it's a reputable career, but we're doing good things for people. And, and that's a, a good part of our existence. And it's uh, rewarding to, uh, to know that we're, we're not just putting a maraschino cherry on top of some whipped cream. We're, doing some real things to help people out. Right, understood. And you were um, Secretary of Agriculture, is that correct? Yeah, I was Agricultural Commissioner for many years. Right, that's and, right. And a uh, long history with people like John on the Food Processing Center, or Kelly with some of the um, farm to school activities. In fact, uh, Kelly and I were the first ones Maybe Jay in, hired me maybe when in he the was country. Commissioner. Uh, oh, okay. Hired her. We had a rocky career because we got <laughs> she got rift, but we continued to do these things, and uh, so it's rewarding. Yeah, the, the very first uh, farm to institution task force in the state was when Jay was commissioner, and I was working for the department. And it was his idea, and we launched it together. And so then we went on to leave the department, but. Um, that's where it started. Sure. Now, uh, Farm to School is a, a national project, but you are the Massachusetts, ch um, not subsidiary, <coughs> but a, 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 um, a sort of affiliate. Yeah. Okay, pardon yeah. me. And, yeah. and could you talk a little bit more about what Farm to School does sure. and, and how it I interacts with the rest of the um, farm economy and, sure. and how it a yep. aids things? Uh, well, I would say that Farm to School in Massachusetts maybe started a little bit differently than it started up in a lot of the rest of the country mm -hmm. because it was primarily focused on farmers and the farm economy. We started from a position of advocating for um, agricultural economic development and then discovered that we had natural allies in the institutional food service directors. And uh, the story I always tell is when I was working for a Department of Ag we used to get to go to food trade shows. It was one of the things we did in our job. And usually, if you knew you were going to a, a food trade show, you would you know, skip breakfast, and you don't bring your lunch, because you're going to go up and down the aisles and eat this great food. So I went to the school food service uh, trade show, which none of us had gone to, and I, and I didn't bring my lunch. And I walk up and down the aisles, and I'm going, oh my god, this food is like so bad. I don't want to eat any of it. I'm, I'm going to starve. I'll wait till I leave. And I thought, this is terrible. This is just really bad food. And then I spent the day talking to food service directors. And mm -hmm. I discovered that they were like a very hardworking, hard-pressed group. They had a um, difficult financial situation. Um, many of them had gone to schools where they were only allowed 15 minutes for meals for the kids. And um, they felt very unappreciated you know that no everyone loves to make a joke about the school food mm. um, and so I went back to the department and we talked about it and I realized that this was like a really natural partnership between the farmers who were also financially pressed who often felt somewhat um, unappreciated mm -hmm. for what they do and these folks who really wanted better food for their kids and, and were having a hard time making it happen so that's really how we started the program and um, 
we feel very strongly that it, it has to be a sustainable program, that it can't be that a lot of grant money comes in, you change the food, and then as soon as the grant money's gone, the whole program falls apart. So from the beginning, it's been that it has to be profitable for the farmers, and it has to be affordable for the schools. Right. And that's the way you mm -hmm. make it sustainable. Um, so this is a, a sort of market-based matchmaking service in yes, a way. Yes, that's right. Um, so that what, what you do is identify um, appropriate partners, whether they be schools or hospitals that's or right. other institutions, yes. and, and and send them on a date, essentially. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> right. And then if they get married, we're happy. And if not, then they can come back to us and we'll find them another date. Oh, I see. So you're not the uh, the mother-in-law, you are the dating service. I'm, I'm the, um, the Yenta, right? Okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and we've branched out since then a little bit. So we're we're now spending more time also looking at programs to educate children as well as feed them because we've understood that kids who start early eating fresh, locally grown fruits and vegetables will become lifelong consumers of that and therefore lifelong supporters of our agricultural economy. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's very nice to see some of the ancillary development. You see more gardens being started by third graders in schools. You see a lot more activity in urban agriculture with yeah. schools and kids growing. And so it's uh, in the nutritional part of it. I mean, it's not just uh, getting, and it's certainly based on getting more money in the hands of farmers and helping strengthen their working landscape so they stay farming for a long time. But it's also nutrition, education, um, getting in the school system, and uh, once the kids have grown something, it looks a lot better when they go through the school line. Yeah. Right, you get yeah. that. Well, you're, you're a farmer as well, in addition to being um, a public servant, and so you have both sides of the equation covered. I've been more successful being a public servant than a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk to John later about a website. <laughs> <laughs> well, in community development, you also plant seeds and hope they grow. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, John, you're um, you're the executive director of the Franklin County Community Development Corporation. Now, um, I know that that your name would indicate that your scope is in Franklin County, mm -hmm. but clearly your impact is broader than that. So, if you could just tell a little bit about what your organization does and and how you operate. So that's certainly, we started 33 years ago in Franklin County, so that's where we got that name. But over the past several years, we've been working throughout certainly Franklin, Hampshire County, and even all over Western Mass. Um, quickly, i got to thank Rural Development, USDA. We got some money from them 11 years ago to build the Western Mass Food Processing Center. Mm -hmm. So that's been a, a, a huge uh, success. Over 250 food businesses have used our commercial kitchen, located in Greenfield, um, to add value to some products. And one of the, over the past couple of years, one of the products we've added value to is the vegetables, local vegetables, and we're freezing it. So as Kelly's talking about getting the fresh vegetables into the schools, sure. you know, our seasons only overlap a little bit here in New England. You have September, maybe October to get the fresh vegetables, but our farmers can grow a lot more than that. So um, I just want to give a shout out to Patrick Wysocki from Amherst here. We bought a lot of peppers from him this year and we froze them, and now they're going out to schools all over Massachusetts. Now, uh, um, sorry to interject, but, and this, this is, can be open to conversation, but the value added to a farmer, the incentive to a yeah. farmer to participate in, in the kind of program you're discussing, in which they're able to produce more and have it frozen and distributed year-round, is simply by virtue of the fact that they produce more food and they're able to sell more and therefore market year round. Is that, is that how it let works? Me, let me give some background. Please. Yeah. So, um, my logs and my wood, by, by most of the logs here often go to Canada, they go out of the state. They're worth 25 times as much if they're processed and sold here mm -hmm. as flooring or paneling or whatever. Ice cream per hundred weight, uh, milk, very inexpensive, worth the same 25 times as much if you go to Gordy Cook's and get an ice cream cone, 25 times. Wow. And so uh, it's interesting to me that whether you're talking about craisins or ice cream or wide pine flooring, a lot of the principles are the same. They're 20 to 30 times more valuable to a farmer if they can cut out a little bit of the middleman and they can get it to the final customer 
And you see it, I mean, even with shredded lettuce, something, a salad mix ready to go versus, um, or a peeled butternut squash. So that's really a tremendous profit potential that farmers more and more are accessing because if you look at graphs, the wholesale price of food this way, the retail mm -hmm. price that way, mm -hmm. huge, every year a bigger gap, and that's the middleman, and that's what John's helping with and others. The value added and the direct marketing is crucial to New England's working landscapes to keep going. Right, and as a, a um, <coughs> as somebody who interacts regularly with end users of agricultural products, it doesn't make any difference for their purposes, whether it is um, fresh or frozen? No, I would say they want both. Right. You know, they would like to have fresh when it's in season, mm -hmm. and um, they would love to have frozen when it's not in season. So um, especially now with the new meal patterns that the USDA has um, announced for all school meals, there's a big requirement for fresh fruits and vegetables, but it doesn't, I should have said that it's not fresh. There's a big new requirement for f how much fruits and vegetables you serve at every meal. And so the, the food service directors are kind of scrambling to find all the ways that they can keep meeting those requirements for the whole year. And, you know, John's frozen broccoli or frozen peppers is definitely a way that they can extend that local season significantly. And the other part of it is the economic development piece of it, is if the farmers can sell more and keep it local, we're not buying it from California. Right, right. now, a lot of the... These, these school lunches that Kelly talked about, some of those products were coming from very far away, traveling a lot of miles, and it's just economically it doesn't make sense. So if we can get it uh, local, you know, from Amherst to the Greenfield uh, Food Center 12 miles, and then it goes out to school, you know, within 20 miles from there, um, that's better for all the local people. It's instead cheaper of having for our money go out into California John, or John, beyond. So. You mentioned 250 businesses. Uh, I think your your operation's been a great incubator. I mean, real pickles. I mean, how many? I mean, tens, if not, uh, of pro of 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 people have started to at thirty bucks an hour to be there, but then they they're they're standalone companies now. Yeah, uh, we've got uh, real pickles and Hillside Pizza, which now has three different places. They started just making frozen pizzas at our center. Now they have three restaurants, and yeah. they continue to make frozen pizzas. Yeah, and then a couple. Uh, Right in Amherst, we have some restaurants, Baku's, and then you have Atkins Farm, who they use our place. We actually make it for them, and then they sell it because they have uh, they have other businesses going on. They don't want to be in the kitchen, mm -hmm. so that's the other service we provide. So it, it's freezing of fresh vegetables, cooking, packing, cooking, canning, pack. freezing. Do you have a cannery? All of the above. Yes, we wow. uh, we have uh, two steam kettles, so we can do up to 160 gallons of a sauce or uh, you know a dressing, a marinade, things like that. And then we get a little assembly line together and we get it in the jar with the label on it and it's ready to go out to the stores. Well, I haven't had lunch, so you're making me so, hungry. Uh, <laughs> and we had a, we, we had a rural development had a nice piece of that. You might mention a fairly large loan just six or eight months ago with a freezing and some equipment to, to make have even more capacity yeah. in your Well Street. And uh, this is spot. where, uh, you know, USDA rural development is really behind the scenes, as Jay said earlier. It's what we work with them. We get the funds, and then we actually got to build this very large freezer, right, add on to our food center. Right. And it's a low-interest loan from, from USDA rural development. So they don't have to do everything. They find folks like us who can actually do it. Sure. And then we recruit people to use our kitchen. And uh, right now we've got, we're working with six large farms, but we need even we're more. Kelly's going to tell yeah, us we need yeah. more supply. Yeah. The demand is out there. You know, grow, you know, grow and eat local. I mean, CESA's been doing a terrific job getting sure. the word out. So now we're worried that we won't even have enough supply. So any, any farms? Yeah, but I remember a year or two ago you mentioned you had an onslaught of tomatoes in yeah. August, and you, you made the great made the local yep. marinara sauce and turned to you know, a sow's uh, ear into a silk purse. There you go. So I would say that that does bring us to another way in which um, USDA has really been very instrumental in helping us build up this edifice that we're building. Mm -hmm. And that is that a as you look at Massachusetts as a whole, we're a pretty small state geographically, but within New England, this is where most of the eaters live. So we've <laughs> got the folks. Understood. And yeah. um, so 
as we look to really institutionalizing this change in our food system where more and more of it will come from closer and closer to home, mm -hmm. we had to say to ourselves, okay, I think this is a regional project. Um, and I say to people, I used to be a protectionist. You know, when I first started Mass Farm to School, it was like, no, it's only about Massachusetts and that's all I want to talk about. But I was converted when I looked at the numbers and realized, well, we really need to bring more food in from places like Maine and Vermont if we want to have a, a big portion of the food that we're serving be from our region. Mm -hmm. So we've, we started an organization called Farm to Institution New England, mm -hmm. which we call FINE. And again, USDA was there at the beginning, kind of bringing us all together, talking about it, and then we did receive a, a, an initial grant from USDA to um, start our regional process. And we are very much involved in looking at farm to college together, we're looking at processing centers, um, learning from each other all over the region, and uh, trying to find all the ways in which we can really work together because this is not boutique. This is not, oh, it's, it's a fad of the moment. This is really about mm -hmm. making a substantial change in the basic fabric of how we deal with food in our own community and how we support our own agricultural economy. Now, I, I, I believe that uh, you always see these stickers on people's cars that said, you know, buy local. Would you discuss a little bit um, what the advantages are of local agricultural production being near where your um, food is produced? Well, I'm just going to give one piece of it that I think is specific to my work, and then I'll let the two of you chime in with other things. But what I've learned is that if you serve kids locally grown fruits and vegetables, or, you know, cheese, milk, whatever, um, there's two things that happen. One is it tends to be very um, tasty. You know, if I harvest the tomatoes today and then they're served in the cafeteria tomorrow, they taste a lot better than mm -hmm. the tomatoes that were grown in California and shipped, mm -hmm. you know, hard all the way across the country. Um, and children, just like adults, can tell the difference. So when people say, oh, kids hate vegetables or kids won't eat that, a lot of times it's just because they haven't had one that tastes really good yet. Um, and we get a lot of feedback from the food service directors that when they go to serving the fresh local, the kids start to eat a lot more of the healthy foods. The other part of that is that we're teaching them the value of supporting their own local economy mm -hmm. and their own community. And so along with the taste of that tomato comes a, a message about how important it is to work with folks in your community to support the farmers to learn more about how this works. And so for us, it's both. <coughs> and, and I think um, from a more global pr perspective, we tend to think that land takes care of itself. Land does not take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And we've got some of the best land in the world in the Pioneer Valley. Um, uh, we get three crops often. Um, there's been um, fertility studies in corn in the last five years, I think three years, the, the most fertile ground in the country has been right in the Connecticut River Valley. And um, y when you think about water retention, you think about tourism, you think about going out for a picnic or going on the top of Mount Tom, a lot of that is the connection with the working landscape. And we've got a real treasure here and we tend to overlook that. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when you, you can't make a reasonable return on your land, right. you, and, and I, I think, you know, Route 9 is Route 9, but a lot of difference between Route 9 and going a couple of miles either way and through some beautiful farmland. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the eating local, buying local. And I think one of the reasons the movement's so strong is you're, you're seeing a a backlash really uh, 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 on the big multinationals and the people that come in and and uh, whether it's Best Buy or Walmart or whatever the, the this money here that goes through John's operation or Kelly's I mean it's recycled five times in the local economy mm -hmm. makes a tremendous amount of difference and when we go and use our customer dollar at the multinationals it's in Los Gatos or it goes to New Zealand or it goes down to Chile or whatever and we never see that money back here recirculating and so eating and buying local products is something that's crucial to our economy and it's more than just money. 
It's, it's a quality of all our lives and what this land does when it stays in open or forested versus other uh, development alternatives that tend to make our area more like the total of USA, which is a lot less exciting for those of us who still cherish what we're lucky enough to live in here in Western Massachusetts in particular. Yeah. Now, speaking in, in sort of raw dollars and cents, uh, given the transport costs for fresh produce that comes from California, for example, is an end user going to see a reduction of cost um, by buying local? What, what we're seeing is because we want to, as Kelly started out by this, we want to get a fair price to the farmer mm -hmm. and affordable to the school or to the end user. And so I think more of it's about getting a fair price to the people along the chain. And so it's probably not going to be cheaper because I think we all know how some of this is, some of the food is grown other places. Mm -hmm. It's grown a little too cheap. We have to, you know, we're too used to cheap food. Sure. But I think affordable food is what we're looking for. And then I get back to the whole local economy. If we're paying fair prices to the farmers, then the farmers are going to hire people and they're going to be able to keep the economy going, which is going to create jobs. So we're all kind of lifting the boat up for everybody. And I think that's another thing that rural development has really helped with. Like they give us a, a million dollar loans to relend to small businesses. So it's not just agricultural businesses, but all rural businesses need this kind of support. And so we're out there making loans to small businesses to help our local economies, you know, in Amherst, and Hadley, uh, Greenfield, all over the place. And, and that's going to help people get the jobs that they need so that they can afford to eat the local food. Understood. Yeah. And so, no, but, but please. I, I also wanted to say, though, with the, the fresh product as opposed to the frozen, it is often true that the, um, the price of the local is about the same as if they were buying from elsewhere, and in some cases it is less expensive. I can tell you that the University of Massachusetts in Amherst claims that they save about 20% every year on their produce, and they are buying uh, uh, almost 30% of their produce is local, and that local is costing them less. And, you know, some of that is about where they're located. Again, it's about transportation. They're very close to mm -hmm. really a lot of farms. Um, if you were in some other parts of the state, it might be a little bit more expensive. But, again, it's working out those details is why we're all here. Because you look at things like distribution and aggregation and processing, each one of those pieces, we've built a multinational food system that militates against the values that we're all promoting. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of taking that apart one little piece at a time and then rebuilding it in a new way that we hope will work better. And that's why um, none of us foresee being able to retire from what we're doing <laughs> anytime soon because it's a challenging prospect. And I'm actually extremely happy about how far we've come in really a short period of time. It's amazing how much progress yeah, we've I mean, made. I think the average of food travels 14, 1500 miles yeah. to where we buy it here locally, and it gets longer every uh, mm -hmm, every true. year. I can answer a little to the farmer. My, my business is not uh, food, it's fiber, but, but I have a self-contained operation. We have a solar uh, array, so we have our own energy really created. Uh, we have our own dry kiln, we have our own planer. Um, and most in Massachusetts, only 2% of the, of, the, of the trees grown here are sold here. They go all the way up to Canada, most of them, and add a lot of multiplying jobs up there, and then they come back. And 2% isn't mm -hmm. very much, but, but I can keep my costs as very competitive. I mean, I have high labor costs, I have high land costs, but that's a lot of trucking. 1,400 miles is a lot of trucking, and I don't think on all pro products we're going to be able to beat somebody that has 60,000 acres of X product. But, you know, there, there can be salmonella issues. There can be a lot of other issues going on in the big global food system. Illegal And I think long-term we uh, we're well-positioned to, if not match the price, with a better product. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, longer term, I, I don't want to keep buying stuff that's 3,000 miles away or 4,500 miles away because you're going to build in some costs there, not to mention maybe a, a week of coming from in a truck, a refrigerated truck from the Salinas Valley or whatever. So I think our local farmers are pretty well positioned and not necessarily um, going to be more expensive for our schools or institutions 
or our, our, our customers in the public, um, given global conditions that uh, I think just common sense, if you can you grow something close to where you buy it, mm -hmm. you're probably mm -hmm. going to have, if cost, I mean, if you ever start building in transportation costs and the environmental costs right. and everything else, uh, we're, we're going to be super well positioned, but we do better than some people now say, oh, it's so expensive at the farmer's market. Not necessarily so. Mm -hmm. Now, Kelly, you, um, you have a supply problem. Um, I, I, well, <laughs> I just can't grow enough. <laughs> my understanding is that that there is um, that there's more demand yes. for yes. Uh, fresh local food mm -hmm. than there is supply. Now, this is a part of a broader question, which is that you have um, farmers getting displaced by development. Um, there are certain incentives that are built in to the tax code to have them uh, stay where they are, to have uh, the land working. Um, but given the fact that you have um, you know, more demand than you can meet, um, what, uh, what mechanism do exists to bring more farmers into um, your um, umbrella and, and to uh, make it worth their while? Well, a lot of it is just about education and outreach. Um, it, we really see the, the wholesale market, uh, the institutional wholesale market, as just one piece of a business plan for most farms. So it's, it's been a process of us trying to really reach out to the ag community and say, you can have your farm stand or your pick your own operation or you go to the farmer's market, but here's another piece of the market that in some ways is easier to deal with because you can just put a lot of product onto the truck and go all at once and drop it off. Um, that you can add on to your business. You don't have to give up the other business you're doing. And it's the same thing with John's processing center. We work very hard to help him find product, and he's the ultimate inconvenience. You know, <coughs> you can put 2,000 pounds of peppers on your truck, you can drive 10 miles to the processing center, you unload it, and you're done. As compared to these other kinds of direct sales where there's a lot of interaction, a lot of work that has to happen with the customers to make the sales happen. So we're going to organizations that work with farmers and train farmers to kind of spread the word, here's another option. And in the eight years that we've been doing this, we've gone from about 12 farmers who were interested in this to we now have about 138 <coughs> farmers mm -hmm. who are selling directly to schools. And we keep working very hard to get the word out to make sure that more farms understand that this is an option. And I, I think we've seen in general that the number of farmers in the state is going up and um, there's a, a feeling within the ag industry that this is something that's actually growing as opposed to shrinking. Well, two things are happening too. There's a lot of land that's still eligible to grow good products. In fact, we've got some on our farm that we hay. You know, I'm thinking, seeing how we can. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. The other thing that's quite rewarding and nice is that you uh, go visit the Center for Agriculture at the University and you go out in South Deerfield and all of a sudden there's there's uh, 55 kids uh, or students uh, uh, taking the course and figuring out that summer how to uh, do the farm plan to sell the product and there was five eight ten years ago mm -hmm. and GCC is involved with it there's a lot of talk about permaculture there's a lot of real interest in getting the next round of farmers excited about getting into an industry where they see some growth potential. Didn't see that. Pun didn't, intended? Yeah, or, or yeah <laughs> pun intended. Didn't see that. Didn't see that. Ten, uh, nothing better than agriculture for puns. Uh, but uh, you didn't see that 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's really quite nice to, I mean, the average age of farmers are like still across the country, they're near 60. I think it's 58. And, and we've got some land, and uh, the educational institutions now are, are being driven by the students, you know. And mm -hmm. That's why you go over to the university, you get some of the best food in the valley at, at one yeah. of their eating commons. Yeah. Everybody talks about the Berkshire Dining Commons of having great food, and the kids are starting to drive this, and it's really exciting because that's the future of these, these students getting into a good business where they can... Uh, send their kids to school and, and, and have a vacation like their, their buddies. And uh, agriculture has uh, you know, the price of land, for better or for worse. It's, uh, 
you know, it's gone up sometimes ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars an acre in the valley. People wouldn't would say, "Wow, five years ago, ten years mm -hmm. ago, agricultural lands were yeah, it's worth that much because it's really good. And nope. It's growing a good product, and people are able to make a reasonable living on it if they're smart farmers." Now we've been talking uh, primarily about plants, you know, um, and and you know vegetables, yeah. fruits, etc. Now, um, are you set up to um, process um, dairy and meat products? Our facility actually isn't, but luckily, and I think rural development and something to do with it, is the slaughterhouse out in Adams has been very, um, Adams Slaughterhouse yep. out in Athol has been very successful. And um, there is some dairy production going on, but we're trying to kick that up a notch too, because if we can do more, um, you know, we're trying to get a dairy plant. That's been a big thing in the area for a while. Um, with a lot of the dairy farms, some of them are kind of fading away, but we got to add some more value there. I don't know if you it, have the latest. It's interesting on that. that the dairy statistics in in New England region, uh, the general dairies are are yeah. dwindling, and but the operations that are a little bit maybe like the Kukowskis over in Hadley, or Gordy Cooks, mm -hmm. the ones that are adding value are going in exactly the different direction on your graph that more and more people are doing what's called producer handling, mm -hmm. making their own ice cream like Gordy or John, and, and uh, it's maybe back to the future when you can go and have 800 customers where you can leave the milk on the back porch. But, but these people are, uh, I think, doing quite well if they're saying, well, I can control my destiny. But the, yeah. the people who can't, and if you're a wholesale farmer in New England, you have a really hard time controlling your destiny. Well, if a, if a farmer has an idea, for example, to add value to his or her product, um, presumably he or she could come to you and say, I have this great idea for adding value, um, but I don't quite have the money for it, and can you help me? Is that that's something you can help with? Well, yeah, I, and I would say, Kelly used the word edifice uh, earlier on, and the word I would use is partnership. We haven't really talked about the Department of Agriculture, yeah. which is the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources now. And they have a whole panoply of programs um, that can be helpful in this area. They can help with business training for new farmers, entrepreneurial business training. There's a farm viability program. If people do a business plan, they can get a little bit of money maybe to implement that plan, do what you suggest. So we have a lot more cheese makers and artisans and people who are on a smaller scale are, are figuring out uh, that, that they, need to, they need to keep the product and turn it into something that is more than a wholesale commodity kind of a thing. Um, and uh, CISA does a great job with uh, the Buy Local campaign. John's doing a great job. Kelly is. There's a lot of partners in this that are are working on on the whole panoply of what needs to be done for educating farmers, helping with distribution, helping with the technology. Universities gotten a lot more interested recently in some of the uh, old extension work, and that's great to see because it's there are a lot of tough things to do if you get into this business. A lot of money. You spent what seven hundred fifty thousand on the freezer? Yeah, I mean it's a uh, real upfront investment. A uh, lot of, I mean anything in agriculture is an investment. And and, and you know, so you have you plan. you have a lot of uh, m money out there, yeah. but I think you have a chance of really um, uh, having a, a more profitable operation long term, because if you're just selling a wholesale commodity, um, who uh, labor? I mean somebody right. trucks it in from. Even California's hurting in dairy. A lot of places that might be offshore and be powdered eventually. You know, they're talking about powdering it, bringing it back, and reconstituting it. Understood. And so, a lot of folks, um, uh, the wave of the future in New England is to do the kinds of things um, they're talking about with a more value added. Maybe just taking the butternut squash and cryovacking it and peeling it and selling it in a way that harried wives and people can just cook it rather than having the time to have Did to you have say hairy, hairy wives? Harried. 
Harry, Harry, Harry <laughs> Wives. I understand. I, I so, said Harry Wives and others, and I didn't talk about binders of anything. I understand. So, um, but I want to say that, again, I think that USDA has been this amazing, again, almost as, as you were talking about I being... Didn't, we didn't pay you, at Kelly. You don't behind, have to. Pay. I know. I didn't, it, be, uh, the way that Jay was talking about that being behind the banks, you know, and, and giving a guarantee, maybe you don't see it. As I think about the work that John and I have been doing on the regional basis, it's, it's kind of the same thing, that USDA was there at the back at the beginning saying, you know, maybe you all in New England need to talk to each other. Maybe you could learn from each other. Let's look at this as a regional project. And, and John, I think you should tell him about, like, how you've become this sort of guru for processing uh, facilities as well, a result of our, yeah. our regional work. Well, John, and to what extent have you become a guru? <laughs> yes. Well, as I said, we started this our food processing center 11 years ago, mm -hmm. and it, some people noticed it back then. But in the past five years, a lot of folks all over the country are noticing it, and so we're getting phone calls and we get visits from people all the time. So, through this farm to institution in New England group, we've put together this, this uh, sharing of experiences, mm -hmm. and there is one now in uh, northern Vermont. There's a, a food venture center, and there's one in Belfast, Maine. So each of us have our little specialties, but we learn from each other because these are investments. They're long-term investments in, in equipment and this freezer that we're building. You know, we've now got to fill, keep that filled up in order to pay back the loan, sure. which means we need some more people, some more users. And I think what we, one of the messages here is that it's, it's really a business. Anything that has to do with food and agriculture, just like anything else, is a business. Right. You've got to have your business plan. When someone comes to, to any of us, that's one of the first things mm -hmm. we, we, we talk about. It's not just like you want to get this one product to market, but what's your overall plan? Because you have to be a little diversified. And that's what we do at the CDC and there's other, others around the state who help with, help with the business planning. And then we bring in the Department of Agriculture. Tilling the soil is a great course for farmers yeah. that really, it just it brings them up a notch so that they don't make these, one mistake can put you under these days. A lot now, of competition it, out there. You are both a non nonprofit organization, correct? Yes. And and obviously the USDA is a government agency. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, what advantages you think nonprofit organizations have over profit-driven organizations in facilitating this kind of activity. Well, one thing is, and we're we're community-based. You know, Kelly's state-based. So our goal is to help the community. Mm -hmm. That's our first, that's our mission. Everything else is to support that. Um, now, when we do say non-profit, but we're not negative profit. Understood. We need to break even. So when we make these loans to small businesses, we need to get repaid. And over our uh, 28 years of lending, we have gotten, most of them have been repaid. We right, but it ain't the money. into John Waits' pocket. It it's doesn't. Not going we, to we, we, we pay the loan back to USDA, and on the, on the little spread that we make, that pays the salaries and all the other sure. expenses we have. So, um, so that's what it, it takes is really the sort of a, a strategic and a business look at things to make sure it's going to be around but, for the long term. I think the answer to your question, uh, one thing I like about what rural development does is that we're empowering the private sector, basically. Yeah. And I think John and Kelly would tell you this. What we're really doing is we're trying to help um, um, farmers and other agricultural businesses be a little more profitable because of all the good things they do with creating jobs and other things. But government can't really do that. I think we can help really support where we should, but uh, we're really dealing 99% of the time with private sector people who maybe need a little education or need some help with financing here or there, but people pay back their loans and they, uh, they, they do a good job, but they, they need a, a whole array of uh, of different skills sometimes to do new things. It's different um, to milk 30 cows versus all of a sudden making cheese, uh, going to Europe, getting European equipment perhaps, coming back, hiring a few people, uh, figuring out how to sell it down in Boston in the market mm -hmm. or through uh, uh, some other. Uh, farmers are really pretty well educated, but you get into these value-added operations you need to be a marketer. You got to know about social media, website development, internet, growing a good product, distributing it. You know, so uh, there's a lot. It's trick, tricky business, and there's been some food processing centers around that have just gone this way. Mm -hmm. John's hasn't, but that's because uh, they've they've run a good shop and gotten some good people they've hired to do the business and. 
these all these businesses are tricky, you know, because what nine out of ten businesses that start eventually fail in the country. So, but if uh, they get business assistance from some other organization, they have yeah. a much better success rate. And right. So again, that's the message: is there's, there's resources out there. You know, people have to and again, be willing to come after them. And again, a lot of what we them. do as a nonprofit is uh, do a lot of that research up front so that when a, a farm is thinking about selling to schools or to a college or to a hospital, we've already got the information about, you know, for instance, like how many um, people there are buying food, uh, what are the products they're looking for, um, how many distribution sites do they have, all the kinds of data that maybe the farmer didn't have time to collect. We can share that information, and then the farmer and the, and the customer together can decide, oh, this is a good match or it's not. Mm -hmm. But it's predicated on working in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And what I say to people is, yes, we're a nonprofit, but all of the work that we're trying to do to make a real change in our food system, by default, has to operate in the economic marketplace in which we live. So unless you go with the European model where the citizens have decided, oh, we want to keep the farms alive and therefore we're going to take you know, government dollars to subsidize farms, which we are not going in that direction, you have to make it work in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started Mass Farm to School, all the farmers assumed that this was like a do-gooder organization. Sure. And they, as soon as I would start to talk to one, they're like, look, I'm not donating my food. I'm not a social service agency. And I would say, that is so not what we're about. It's totally about helping you figure out what's f profitable for you and affordable for the schools. But we, uh, I mean, uh, John mentioned earlier about we'd love to have maybe help with a regional uh, milk processing. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are little bits and pieces of it, and, and nine or ten farms do it with our family far, farm. But it's not, uh, it's not quite as developed as it could be. It's an opportunity, but it's not our role to go out. People need to come. Right. People need to say, that here's how it can work. Right. Right. Work with John or Kelly. Here's the markets. And so you, you, you can't do everything, and that's driven by farmers and private businessmen that want to say, well, how do we do that and maybe enter into a partnership with some of us to see how we can pull it off. Now, I want to ask John, let's just, I, I happen to like pickles, okay? So that when Jay talked about real pickles, yeah. um, it, let's just say I'm growing cucumbers, yep. okay? Now, I have a truckload of cucumbers. I bring it to the processing facility. Now, is the, just to use real pickles as an example, are they also the uh, the producer, or are they the they buy the pickles from? I mean, there's a cascade of benefits here, and presumably, if the p pickle farmer and if the cucumber farmer and the pickle maker are different entities, um, there's presumably a benefit that that goes yep. up and down the line. Yep so that it becomes worth it for everybody. Now, please describe how that works. So that's how most of our, most of our food businesses are not the farmers, and then they have a working agreement or a contract with a farmer to grow so much. But because agriculture is dependent on the weather, they ha it's, it's hard to have a firm contract, but they work together. So Real Pickles started with you know, 20,000 pounds of pickles the first year, that was almost 10 years ago, and now they're up to hundreds. And they've added farms, um, and they then do the processing and marketing and selling. And that's the same with us and our frozen vegetables. Now we were able to pay, we ended up paying the same price to the farmers delivering it to us as they would have gotten in a Boston terminal market. And we saved them, you know, the 100 miles drive and a lot of hassle back there. Yeah. So we're always uh, trying, to, trying to juggle that too. So a lot of people have ideas for food out there and you could either be the one to actually make it or just market it or grow it. So there's lots of entry points into the whole And there's food different business. scales in, on people's uh, farm businesses. And some of us can add value and have some products and projects. But on the other hand, if we have a lot of a product that is low, lower value, it's great to have both. It's right. not either or. Right. You don't always have to do value added for every product you might grow on your farm. You can maybe say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make more on that artisanal cheese with 15% of my milk, but I still would love to have a, uh, if I can only sell X units of cheese, I've still got something from 35 other cows 
So maybe I break even, but I move it and I, I have right. some volume that yeah. I deal with. Well, so so it's not uh, either or on some of these we things. We have six apple orchards now who bring us their, their seconds. Like in January and February, the mm -hmm. apples start getting a little soft. They can't sell them as firsts anymore. We make applesauce and apple butter, sure. and then they take them back and sell them at their farm stands. Understood. So it's, it's it, it, otherwise a couple of years ago it would have been a loss. Right. And now they're getting some so everybody, money for it. To, to, to so. make a, a pun, everybody gets a slice of the pie, so to speak. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> and we've also been able to find some connections uh, similar to this. When we first started Farm to School, we discovered that in the retail market with apples, the retailers all want big apples. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a lot of small apples, all you could do was send those in for the juice market, and they were really not worth anything. And then we discovered, well, little kids have little stomachs, and they don't <laughs> want the great big apples. They're getting thrown out. So a lot of the farmers that had small apples were able to start very profitably mm -hmm. selling those small apples to the schools, which were then really happy because they were getting more apples per case, mm -hmm. and the kids were eating more of each apple. Mm -hmm. So it's looking for those avenues of opportunity that we might not have thought about. If you don't mind, though, I wanted to just go back for a minute and just put in my plug that we are a nonprofit, so one of the things that, that's really important to us that's a difficulty is that we cannot take money from any farmers because we want to be seen as completely neutral. We're never promoting one business over another. And so those whom you think would most be supporting our project financially, actually we cannot take money from. So if there's anyone else out there <laughs> who'd like to give money to our program, this is always a big challenge Shameless. for us. Shameless. Shameless, Kelly. We, and your, and your, your website is? It's, uh, it's massfarmtoschool.org. Okay. And, and, you know, we have gotten great support from the USDA and from the Mass Farm um, Department of Ag. We have private funders. We have foundations. But it's a continuing challenge for us, as I know it is for the Food Processing Center, to come up with the funding we need to continue to implement the statewide program. It's, it's, it's unfortunate in a way that, that you... Um, fulfill such an important function as a, a sort of intermediary go-between, yet by rules of ethics, really? you're really yeah. not allowed to gain any sustenance right. from that relationship. That's right. That's right. Um, now, uh, clearly one of the challenges you face is funding. Now, we're going to have to wrap up shortly, but um, uh, I wanted to ask you, what, what are some of the challenges that, that FCCDC um, face, and, and how are you planning on dealing with it? Well, again, what if our business plan, just like any nonprofit, we're, we're a business too, and what we want to do is get more users in our food center. We do charge a fee. We try to keep that fee down, and we can keep that a low fee if more people use it. So we have more capacity at our food center. Um, so that's one way we, we bring in the revenue. And the other is through our lending program, the same thing. If we make good loans and we, we get the spread on that, then we'll keep going for a long time. As I said, we've been around for 33 years and expect to keep going. But now that we're expanding into Hampshire County, there's even more opportunity for folks to use our services. And, you know, uh, eventually it, it benefits us when we get the good business who, in the early years, we spend more money, we help them, we spend time and energy helping them uh, run their business, or at least with their business plan. Eventually we start getting um, the interest, you know, in the, in the later years when they grow and become more profitable. So that's Do you have mentors that work with you? We match up people a lot. I mean, there's Real Pickles has been around for 10 years, has, you know, has helped a lot of folks. So we do a lot of referrals like that, which is kind of the best business advice if you get it from someone who's actually yeah. done it, not someone who's been sitting in an office or behind a, you know, a loan desk. Understood. So. Anyway, with that, I wanted to, to wrap up here, um, but I do want to uh, thank Jay Healy for sitting with us. Thank you. Absolutely, and Kelly Irwin. Thank you. And John Waite. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thanks so much for, uh, for tuning in, and this is Amherst Media. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.